some of us that just don't really cut out for greatness. Some of us just can't boat flip nine pounders, Billy. <laughs> That's why you lost him right there. That's right. Because you didn't just boat flip his big old butt. I know. I know. You just got to get your head coming up and then just pull a little bit of just enough to get him over the gunnel, baby. Dude, I, I was in an awkward position. <laughs> oh, welcome back, guys. Isn't that, how you, isn't that how you live most of your life, though, is in an awkward position? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty flexible still. Touch and go. It's touch and go. Fish Life Podcast, yeah! Woo, we back! <laughs> oh man, my left, your right. No hesitation, he's getting smart. Come folks. on with it. It's Just Billy Lawson, your Lake Ford guy, that's who I am, yeah. guys. Yeah. In case you didn't For know. For you YouTube folks, In y'all can read. <laughs> never seen one of these before. Oh, Scruff McGruff over here. Yeah, we're going to bring it to a halt with Inside 2. We broke, <laughs> we keep breaking records. Yeah. We're off the rails within we, the first couple minutes this week. That's how we did. We should, we didn't even make a minute. We Dude, started yeah. off off the rails. We just started off the rails. Oh, man, it's kind of how we live our life, in awkward positions and off the rails. We need to get a crane and get this train back on the track. Somebody needs to get the train back on the tracks. Man, what is going on? Dude, this weather is going on. This weather's going on. Uh, we had another flood last week. Um, but... Uh, we got warm nights. Things are looking up. From the day we're actually filming this, mm -hmm. by the time you guys are hearing this, this will have already taken place, but several warm nights in a row. We got a little bit of light rain here and there this week, nothing drastic. Uh, shouldn't be any problem. But a lot of warm nights and a full moon. Actually, as we sit here, there's a full moon tomorrow night. I was looking at it as we walked out tonight. I was like, mm -hmm. you see that thing? Bring them to me, baby. Mm -hmm. Come <laughs> bring on. Bring them to me. Come on with it. That full moon's going to bring them in. And I'm going to tell you the big deal for me, I'm really excited about, A, I just watched the Bassmaster Classic. We're going to talk about the Bassmaster Classic tonight. We are. We are. Congratulations to Hank Cherry. That was awesome. Um, so we're going to talk about the Classic. Just watch that today. And then... Few more days, few more, few more days. The MLF Bass Pro Tour, which for me this is my biggest event of the year because it's on Lake Fork and it's all like the big names. Yep. The whole Bass Pro Tour roster, they're hitting it at such a good time. They're showing up like three or four days after a full moon, which is an unbelievable time to show up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like that is about as good a time to show up. A full moon in March, three or four days after that, that's about as good as it gets. Usually, typically on Fork, right? That's about mm -hmm. as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. So the fishing should really pick up this week. It should build throughout that tournament. Um, I'm excited. Oh yeah. I'm as, I'm as excited for that for this MLF Bass Pro Tour tournament on Lake Fork this week as I have been for any tournament I can remember in my life. Yep. Well, and you know, as as far as the foreseeable future, as far as the eye can see, the weather is really going to cooperate with this deal, and it's liable to just you know. The Oof. only thing I can say, if there's any guys that want to go sight fishing, like me, I would love to sight fish all week. It's going to be a challenging week to sight fish. We're going to have a little bit of wind. Right. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of rain, which is going to break up the surface, and that makes it hard to sight fish in the rain because it clutters up the surface. You can't right. see through it as well. Uh, and, of course, cloudy days come with rain, so the cloudy days make it a little bit harder. So the sight fishing deal may not be the deal this week because of the visibility, and we just had a flood last week, so there's still a lot of dirty water in the lake. Right. Um, especially in the areas where fish spawn early. We're still early mm -hmm. in the spawning cycle. Way early in the spawning. Like, it's just now getting going. Um, so, there's going to be some challenges to the bed fishing guys that are wanting to do that. I don't think this tournament's going to be one bed fishing. I don't think it would have been one bed fishing if conditions were right, because they count every bass. Right. And if you find the right group on the right point, staging, you're going to run away from anybody that's trying to sight fish. You're just going to catch them so much faster. But we're getting all off into that, and this is just supposed to be the intro of what we're talking about. So tonight we're talking about the Classic. We're talking about Bass Pro Tour on Lake Fork this week, the Goat mm -hmm. Lake. We also have your your Lake Palestine tournament mm -hmm. just ended today. It did. And he did not top five, folks. He did not win. Nope. He, he did bad. not have a great couple days here. So bad. we get to talk about the punishment. Yes. Because you were so confident mm. about your chances at this tournament on a lake that you live on mm -hmm. in the springtime, you just knew you were going to do good. You even said, we even said, if you don't win, you have to agree to <laughs> let me pick a punishment from viewer recommendations. So we're going to pull up the viewer punishments tonight and find us a punishment for yeah. Chris. And we're going to document that guys and film God. it for you that watch on YouTube. We'll film it. I hope it's an outfit for Lake of the Pines. I don't know. I'll have to see. That's my decision. to make. No, I know. I'm just saying that's what I, that are my, those are my hopes. Because You're not going to tell me what to do, Chris. <laughs> I just want to be comfortable in my own skin. Well, you're going to be uncomfortable in whatever I pick. I can assure you that, sir. So stay tuned for the punishment announcement. We'll save that one for the end. Um, 
So here, okay, let me let me transition to this. Thing. Okay. Um, we talked about current conditions. You know, we've had some flooding. You know, we've had some cool nights in the last couple of days. Yeah. Kind of knock water temps a little bit down. Yeah. Yep, yep. Um, but not bad. Just a little no, bit low sixty. Terrible. Like not anything crazy. Well, see, I saw a lot different, but I don't. I think from what I'm hearing from a lot of people, I got a lot more rain than y'all did, because. No, we got a ton of rain, but I mean, what'd you say your water temps were? They were 63 and fell to what, 57? I had 55, 56 today. See, and that's what I mean. Like, fish will still spawn in that. Well, I know that water temp. Like, but, what I'm saying when I say it's not too drastic, it's not such a drastic change that it's gonna stop the progression of the spawn. Right, I know what you're they're saying. They're not if they're on a bed at 63 and the water temp drops to 56, they're not leaving that. They're bed. still gonna do the business. They may not be as active. They may be harder to catch by all means. Right. They might be a little more prone to leave that bed when you get on top of them, right. but they're not leaving the bed. They're not stopping the spawn. Exactly. No, I know what you're saying. Now, if that water got down to the 50-degree marker below, yeah, they're going to bail out and have to hit a reset button on that spawn. Right. But it wasn't like we had a big 10 to 15-degree swing. We had a, a 5 to 7-degree swing in water temp. Mm -hmm. Not going to deter those fish. The water's still warm enough. Right. There's, and, and there was probably some water that didn't drop as much as others did. Yeah, so. you know, and I, and I found different water. I, I did a lot of sticking and moving today. Um you know, it was just kind of one of those deals. Um, but I was telling my partner, you know, there's going to be some fish trapped in some of these areas, and we just right. we're just going to have to work harder for them. And you know, we we worked hard. It was not for lack of effort. I assure you, <laughs> I'll put it that way. Um, so let me just redirect. Um, so when you do have, you know, a temperature swing like that, where mm -hmm. it makes it a little bit tougher, what's your go-to as far as like, okay, I'm gonna. I'm going to go back to ground zero, and I'm going to kind of go this route to yeah. kind of change it up. You know, if I've been fishing a lake a lot, and I've seen some fish pulling in to start the spawning cycle, or pulling in and start chasing bait like they do in the spring sometimes, mm -hmm. if I'm confident that a little shallow water spawning type area has a lot of fish in it, then I'm going to anchor down and just fish real, real slow and methodical. I mean, listen, guys, that early March can be a bear. When you get behind a cold front early March, it can be tough to catch them. Mm -hmm. And the only way that I know to consistently catch them in those situations is to get in those areas that you, in, that you know have fish, that you're confident you have fish in, and go extremely slow and pull out your wacky worms and pull out your sinkos and pull out your drop shots. This is a time where mm -hmm. I will use a drop shot. Uh, and just fish real methodical. Maybe not quite up on the bank, pull out off the bank a little bit. Because that's what those fish are going to do. They're going to pull out, kind of hit the brakes and stall a little bit until they get a little more sunshine, a little more warm trend, then they'll get right back up on the bank. So, I mean, to me, it's just a matter of slowing down enough. You already got a situation going where fish are spread out. Yeah. So it's not like you're going to sit there and make one cast and catch a bunch. You don't need to move real fast. Right. Because if you find one bite, it doesn't mean you're going to find another. It's these not, fish it's are not getting, the early staging. We're getting to yeah. the time of year where these fish are not grouped up. They're spread out. That's right. what's happening. Um, so you need to... Get in an area that you know have them, that you have confidence has them, and just really take advantage of every bite you can get. Just pick it up. Because there's nothing you're going to do in those type of areas in this situation to sit there and catch five in a row. Right. It's not happening. Right. It's not going to happen. No, I'm with you. The other way you can go about that is to go out and fish the staging areas, back off a little bit deeper off some of these shallow points, and go to throwing a jerk bait. Or, again, a drop shot. Something really slow. Again, get in an area that you're confident should have some fish on it, and fish really slow and methodical. Now, does that always work out? Not always. Some days you have tough days. But that is your best chance on these post-frontal, cold front, cold trending days in early March to make sure that you still catch good quality fish and a good a good bag of fish. Um, is is to fish like that. Get where they are and, and be real thorough. Yeah, we and you know we did that and we just happened to be on the on the bad end of that deal. But you know that's how it goes sometimes. It's just fishing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, you're not going to catch them every day. I don't care who you are. I mean, yeah. it, the best in the world have days where they don't catch them. That's right. So um, let me ask you this, too. What, As far as a bed fishing bait, when you got a fish on a bed, you pull up, she's locked on, she's ready to rock, what's your go-to bait? You know, I don't really have a go-to bait for bed fishing. I honestly don't. Um, I think bed fishing is way more about that fish's attitude and how it's reacting to the bait and you being able to understand that fish's attitude. I don't think the bait's really that important. I like something short and compact with some wiggle to it. Mm -hmm. By wiggle, I mean some legs, some appendages that'll move. Right. And it'll move, they're thin. I like thin appendages. So they'll move with very little water pressure. So when that bait's sitting there and I'm just barely giving that rod a little vibration, those, those appendages are giving it some movement, some action. So 
Um, I like things like a uh, that bigger size raised menace is really good. Mm-hmm. Um, the stroker crawl from Six Sense is probably the one I'm going to bed fish with the most this year. Yeah, that'll probably be the bait I use the most. Uh, I've used the uh, smash crawl from Smash Tech back when they were before they discontinued that. I've used that. Uh, Berkeley Chigger Crawl work, uh, Zoom Speed Zoom Crawl, speed crawl. Yeah. Um, you know, baits like that. Compact, short, compact baits so that they can't grab the tail end of the bait and not get the hook. Mm-hmm. Or it makes it tougher for them right. to grab the back end of the bait without getting the hook in their mouth. Uh, and baits that have movement with very little water pressure, so they have thinner appendages. That's really what I'm looking for. Okay. I mean, it's pretty much, you're, we're in line on that deal. Yeah, I mean it's it's just it doesn't the bait doesn't matter. Yeah, like ninety nine 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 percent of the time on a bed fish. And the color doesn't matter as the long bait, as you can see it, correct? And, well, it, no, I don't want to see it. Actually, I've changed my. I mean, listen, I know years ago I used to want to see it, and I think that's kind of the common thing for the average everyday fisherman is you want to see that fish eat the bait. I don't want to see the fish eat the bait because here's the deal: when you're bed fishing, a lot of times they will bite it and spit it, mm-hmm. bite it and spit it. Bite it and spit it. Well, if you see your bait go in that fish's mouth and you swing and that fish is in the middle of spitting out and you rip that bait away and you don't hook that fish, you're going to spook that fish most of the time. Yeah. You're going to spook that fish and it's going to set your clock back. Not that you can't still catch that fish, but you're going to spook that fish. It's going to take longer for him to settle back in and bite again. But if I don't see him bite the bait and I'll feel him, when they bite and spit it and I don't see him biting it, I'll feel the bite and then I'll feel the spit because I'm paying attention to the feel. I'm not right. watching right so i'll feel the fish bite it and spit it but i'll also on the other hand when that fish bites it and moves with it or bites it and holds it i'll feel that too and that's what i'm waiting for so i actually use natural colors green pumpkin watermelon i also think on pressured lakes like lake fork or all these popular lakes gunnersville okeechobee clear lake wherever you want to go where there's a lot of pressure on fish when they get on beds especially i mean everybody wants to sight fish right you know when, when it's going down everybody's sight fishing well I think that using more natural colors gets you more bites than using a white color does. I've seen fish that won't, that'll, when, you know, a lot of times you'll pitch into a bed and a fish will leave and then it'll do a loop and come back and look at your bait. Mm-hmm. And that's a normal thing. Right. And I've seen fish that when I pitch a green pumpkin in there will leave, come back and look at the bait. But if I pitch a white in there, they'll leave and then they will never come back to the bed. I've seen that happen. So that's years ago what really convinced me to go to more natural colors. And now I won't throw anything unless it's a natural color. Unless the water's really dirty, and then I'll start throwing some, you know, if I'm just seeing fish move off a of bed, I'm not really truly sight fishing, I'm just kind of blind fishing a bed, then I may use an electric blue or white or something real hard colored to make help the fish see it. Right. I still can't see the bait, though. Never, never at any time do I see my bait sitting in that bed. Very, very rare. When the water's super crystal clear, I may see my bait sitting in that bed, but it's because I can see a watermelon seed bait. Right. It's not because I'm using a bait that I want to see. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, so how do you decide? How do you decide distance on a bed fish? Let me ask you that. The distance you position your boat, from, okay? Because yeah, yeah, that, a that's... lot of a lot of people, and you know, I've done, I've been guilty of this in the past too. Yeah. When I was learning how to do it, you know, you get first of all, stay off your trolling motor if you can, first and foremost. Yeah, turn it way down. Turn it way down. Turn uh, your graphs off. Turn your graphs off. Use yeah. a push pole, all that stuff. That's a real thing. Uh, you know, graph- I've gone away. I don't really use a push pole anymore, but that's just because I kind of know the waters that I'm navigating real good. Um, power poles to me are a big deal. You know, those talons are a lot louder, and those talons are constantly readjusting when you're sitting there making that noise. Mm-hmm. I think power poles are a big deal because they're quieter going in, and once they get down, they're silent. And, and once you get your power poles down, your trolling motor, you don't have to have your trolling motor on. You got your graphs off. You're making zero noise. Right. Noise is a big deal. Distance is a really important thing. And there's some advantage to having, you know, it's a huge advantage for, for guys that can see fish better in the water. Mm-hmm. Like guys that have more time to experience, like Zach Hughes and Eric, man, them guys can see fish in the water as good as anybody. Oh, I know. Um, it's a big advantage. And it, what it also does is it allows you to set up further away from that fish. Right. Where I want to set up distance wise in my boat is as far away as possible. Right. In fact, when you know, I talk about not being able to see the bait. When I set my boat up, I'm not really able to see the fish. Like what I'll do is I'll drive by, I'll see one on the bed, I'll line the bed up, mark where the bed is exactly, kind of judge his behavior, how fast he's coming back to it or whatever. And then I'll make a big loop and set up way outside of that. And what I'll do is I'll start easing in. And when I can just see the bed, but I can't really see the fish yet, that's when you slam it. I'll down. power pull down. Yeah. 
And then I'll sit there and I'll study that bed for a few minutes and I'll look for movement. And a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see that fish move. Okay, now I can see that fish. Like when I just pulled in here, I couldn't see that fish. But once he moved, I saw him. Now I got him. Now I can see the fish. Right. But barely. Like I can't count dots on him. Mm -hmm. You know, I can only see him when he moves across the bed. If he's sitting dead still, I don't really see him. You know, if I throw my bait in and he rolls up on the side, I might see the white of his belly. But I'm not just sitting there looking at the fish. I want to get to where I really can't see the fish unless he moves or rolls or does something. And that's where I want to pitch from. And I'll pitch there, pitch there, pitch there, pitch there. Now, the only time I change that is if I'm if I know that fish should be there, he if I'm pretty sure he was locked on. And I pitch in there and I don't ever see any movement. I don't see the fish after I started pitching in there. I'll ease in a little bit till I can see the fish a little bit better. Gotcha. And but still the whole goal is to stay as far away as possible and still be able to present that bait to that fish. And if I can't see him half the time I'm fishing for him, I'm fine with that, as long as I see him once in a while. Right. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a big key. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. Because, <clears throat> you know, when I was first learning how to do it, I can't tell you how many fish that I spooked off a of bed, yeah. and they never came back. And they may, for all I know, they may have been locked on that bed. Well, and I'm going to tell you, just from fishing back in the day, fishing tournaments and different stuff, when it was side fishing time, like when I go fish like a little jackpot on Lake Holbrook during side fishing time, I didn't have to worry about all that. Well, you just roll up there where you can see them, and you start flipping. Yeah. But, you know, Lake Fork's a different animal. Oh, absolutely. And a lot of these popular big fish, trophy fisheries that get a lot of pressure on them, you know, that makes all the difference in the world. It's the pressure. Like, if I roll up on a lake that doesn't get a huge amount of pressure, and these bed fish aren't really being fished for, then I don't, I'm not nearly as conservative with my distance. Right. I still try to stay away because it still makes it easier. Mm -hmm. But I... I just I get to where I can just barely comfortably see the fish and then fish for them. I don't worry. And then if that fish is giving me a hard time, I'll back off him. But on a lake like Fork. Oh, I mean, how many fish have you caught off a bed on Fork that already got two holes in the top of their head? I know, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, it's crazy the amount of pressure these fish get. Uh, it's also the only place where you'll see bed fish that you can literally run your boat and damn near bump them in the head with your 20-foot boat and they won't even flinch. Oh, yeah. They after, you know, when you get to like April like mid-April, these fish get so used to seeing so many boats go over the top of them. They're just like, like yeah, whatever. They'll, there will be fish <laughs> that will sit in a bed, and you can throw your bait in there and hit them in the head over and over and over again, and they'll just sit there and never flinch, dude. Mm -hmm. Like to the point where you'll be like, was that really a fish? Yeah, no, it's a fish. Because mm -hmm. you get right up on them and be like, oh, that's a fish. But they've just seen so many baits. They've seen so many boats. They're just sitting there. All they're going to do is sit on that bed, and they ain't going to do nothing. Dude, I remember, I remember very vividly one time, this was back in my cobra days when I still had the cobra. I was out there sight fishing, and I was fishing in the I was fishing the horseshoe, and I had one on a bed. And I'm telling you, my boat was probably 15, 20 yards from the fish, but I could see the fish. Yeah. And I'm pitching in that bed, and that fish is paying no mind to my bait. Didn't like, even flinch. Didn't even flinch. <laughs> yeah. And Never so, checked up or nothing. Nothing. And I had to finally resort to basically pissing that fish off to the point where she had no choice but to. Get yeah. it and go. But I ended up catching her, but it took two and a half hours. Yeah, so about the only thing you can do if you get a fish like that is to get kind of perpendicular to the fish where you can throw across its head mm -hmm. and get like a three-quarter or one-ounce jig or Texas rig, just a big heavy weight, pitch it past them, and just hit them as hard as, like, pitch the bait past them, get it on the ground, punch your rod down, and snap it and hit them as hard as you can in the gill plate mm -hmm. and just do that until they start doing this. When they start circling... When they start whipping in a circle real quick and jumping right back in the middle of bed, okay, now you got something. Now yeah. you pick up your regular bait, pitch it in there, and they'll nose down on it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes that works. Sometimes it runs them completely off. Yeah. But you get to a point with some of these fish out here on these pressured lakes where you're like, well, I'm making no progress. Like, no, there's nothing happening. Oh, yeah. So you got to do something. And I can't tell you how many times I had to use that tactic. And it worked It a can lot. work. It can work. I mean, you either got to bail out on that fish or try to make it by, mm -hmm. by drastic means. So. Side fishing's a funny deal, man. And, you know. It's very, it's the only thing like it in the sports why i love it so much we're limited on how long we can do it because of the seasonal nature of it but it's just there's nothing else quite like it in the sport i, I just love I, I love pulling up looking at the fish on the bed doing my loop because that's that's the whole reason i asked you about that because i was sight fishing with a friend of mine one time and i said that's bed fish and he's just sitting over looking. He said, oh, yeah, it is fish on a bed. And I just kept cruising. I cruised another 50 yards. Yeah. And he was like, we're, we're not going to fish for that fish. I said, hold on, Bubba. We, yeah. We're going to get back around. And then we got back up on it. Yeah. And it's, 
I don't know. I, yeah, and that you know, speaking of that, one thing I'll do is I'll didn't mean to make this a sight fishing seminar tonight on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, but here we go. Well, I mean, it's that time of year. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. So I'll go into a cove and I'll get pretty close to the bank where I can see them real good, and I'll actually turn my trolling up a little bit and try to make them move to make me see them. Mm-hmm. And I want them to run off the bed, and I'm judging how locked in they are by how how far they run, how fast they run, and how. How uh, likely they are to come back, how, how quick they come back, how mm-hmm. enthusiastic they are about getting back on that bed as I cruise by them. And I'll literally cruise by them until I've spotted three or four or five that I want to fish for. Mm-hmm. And I'll mark every bed in my mind. Then I'll loop back around and start at the beginning, staying way out off them. Okay, now we caught that one. Now we'll move to the next one, catch that one. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of how I do my deal. But um, I lo- I side fishing is great, man. It's so much fun. It's so much different. It's a, it's a mind game. It's a battle of... Uh, wits between you and the bass in in every way possible and then when you do hook them big ones especially it's close quarters combat it's chaos there's usually in a lake like fork or these east texas lakes there's wood and grass to deal with and it's a fight a bunch of big splashes going on water flying it's just (laughs) pure chaos man and so it's great that way too and uh you know, you're not fishing with big 50-pound braid. I mean, a lot of times you're right. fishing with fluorocarbon line, so it's a challenge. Mm-hmm. You're not fishing with your biggest, most heavy action rod because you're real close on your hook set. If you get too big a rod, you'll you'll rip the bait away from them. So it's uh, it's very unique. It's I like, very unique. I like looking at them in the water and trying to guess how big they are and then actually catching and them. And you're almost never right. Never right. Never you're almost right. never right. <laughs> never right. They can. It depends on the water clarity and the depth they're sitting in the angle you're at, but they can come out bigger or smaller than you think. Oh, dude, I have. <laughs> I've had some come out and go, man, I thought that was four pounder. It's a two pounder. I've had some come out and go, man, I thought it was four pounder. It's a seven pounder. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, I've had it both ways. One extreme to the other. That's right. So. Yeah, those are great sight fishing tips. That's a that's going to help a lot of people this year catch more and bigger fish. So, uh, that's what we're all about we're all here, about. Lake Fork God. What we're also about is being fans of the sport and the Bassmasters Classic. Congratulations, Mr. Hank Cherry. Yes, today. Hank Cherry, who, by the way, suffered one of the biggest heartbreaks in classic history a few years ago. Um, so good on him for coming back and winning the one. That was really cool to see. If you watch the live coverage, I know you didn't get a chance to because you're fishing your tournament. Right. I watched a little bit of the live coverage today. At the end of the day, like he did a good job of holding his mind together because he had like 17 pounds mm-hmm. and he thought that's what he needed to kind of have a good chance to win but he wasn't sure that he had done enough and it was all he could do to keep himself from spinning out like being a fisherman that, that's been on the water a lot and so mm-hmm. fished enough tournaments like i know where he was at mentally like if you fished enough tournaments and you've had a good day but you're just not sure that you did enough to win like now exaggerate that times a thousand because it's the Bassmasters Classic. Oh, yeah. And his history of losing fish. And he lost one this morning, a big one this morning. He lost a big one yesterday. And so in his mind, he's going, did I do it again? Did I lose the fish that I needed? And you can just, he never come out and said it, but he said enough things. To kind of elude towards that. About other people who, I don't know what other people have caught. I don't know right. if I've got enough. Like they, Like he was borderline on spinning out and he held it together and it was really interesting to watch um his mental process and how he was just able to keep grinding like he just kept his head down and kept grinding through all that mental anguish he was going through because you know in his head it was he was all monkeyed up inside his own head you could tell but he just kept fishing and every time one bit he caught it he kept his focus it was really impressive it was that's one thing about the live that you just don't get on the tv show is you get to see these guys go through the whole mental process of the tournament day, and that was a really interesting dynamic with Hank. Well, I will say with the live, that is a, that is one thing that I actually do really enjoy about the live portion and the, yeah. the bass tracker because they're not just flipping over to this guy because he just caught a six-pounder. Yeah. They're, you know, they're... And he's just sitting there talking to him as Marshall, whatever you know. Just you kind of get the inside look of the yeah, last bit, and yeah. just kind of what's going no, through their head I'm, because they're open book, bro. If we're being perfectly honest, it's a little bit like baseball. Sometimes it's boring. Yeah, oh, yeah. like live coverage of bass fishing <clears throat> tournaments at times is a real snooze fest. But you get guys, you know, like but if you're thoroughly into the sport, like right. especially especially with something like the classic, <clears throat> with the classic, like it's such a big big deal. And then the mental aspect and the history with Hank and the losing the fish, it just made that, for me, it made it a really, I was as into watching what he was saying and trying to figure out what he was thinking as I was the fish mm-hmm. he was catching. It was very interesting. So let me ask you this. How was he, uh, how was he fishing? Was he cranking? 
Well, no, he was throwing a jerk bait on Bridge Rip Rap in Gunnersville, surprise, which Hank Cherry throws a jerk bait as much yeah, as anybody on planet Earth. That's right. But he was also flipping some docks, and he caught he caught some fish off docks, uh, and it's something he resorted to at the end of the day. He had some areas on that bridge he was wanting to get to that were just crowded. And that, you know, you go to Gunnersville, them guys are going to deal with that on the MLS this week at Fort. Oh, yeah. They're going to go to pull up on a shallow point, and there's going to be two or three boats sitting there that ain't going to be able to fish it. Uh, there's going to be times where they may not be able to get on the stuff they really want to get on to try and win that tournament. That's going to mm-hmm. be something they deal with. And, but those guys deal with that in a lot of places, especially when they go to these big, big name, fisheries, you know, legendary type fisheries like Gunnersville and Fort. But, uh, you know, he had some stuff he couldn't get on today that he wanted to, and so he ended up resorting back to. He had a secondary pattern on some docks, and he went, I, I don't remember, I think he called one fish on the dock pattern. I don't remember, I think he made one call late in the day with the dock, gave him a little bit more weight. But we well, ended up with 19. He ended up with 19. I, I guess I turned it off a little too soon, because I'm pretty sure he still had 17 when I turned it off. Or maybe it was 17 on Bass Tracker, and it ended up being 19. Yeah. I think I saw every fish that he caught. Because well, those are unofficial that. results. Those are unofficial on Bass yeah. Track, so maybe his fish were just a little bit bigger than what they were estimating them at on uh, on Bass Track. But sixty five five is no slouch. Three days, for three days. It's pretty, pretty good. good. Oh, and they yeah. got you know that same flood we got this week. They got it the day before the tournament. That's right. So they, they had just, a lot of adverse conditions to deal with. Well, they had cool training water. They had they had you know. Colder than you would like it, dirty, rising, flooding water, just like we did. So uh, it was tough. But you know, Hank Cherry, man, that was that was great. It was oh, yeah. really fun to watch watch him. The mental dynamic of it was really fun for me. You know, I had picked, I had Stetson picked. Stetson had a good tournament. He had a really good tournament. He had a really good tournament. I would have been happy to see him win it. That dude is a hammer. He's a really good fisherman. He's a really good guy. Uh, I have somebody that I know that knows him personally pretty well, and he's he's a really high quality individual. So, so let's let's just kind of round out some of these names in the top. Uh, we'll go to the top fifteen just to make it make it fair. Seth Fighter at four. As, as we go into this, there's something we got. I mean, the elephant in the room, especially as much as we're going to talk about MLF here in a minute. This is my whole deal, man. Like, and I know there's people that say, "Oh, they'll make new heroes or whatever." I don't want him to make new heroes. You can't make me a new hero if he doesn't beat the old heroes. That's right. And what I'm talking about here, guys, is the Bassmaster roster for this classic is just not the same. You didn't fish against the otter. Like you The deal didn't. is, it, it, you won the Bassmaster classic, classic, Hank Cherry, and that's great, but you won it against 20 names, 15 names, 10, 20, 15, something like that, names that actually should have been there. Like, if this was the Bassmaster Classic from five years ago, there's only 10 to 15 guys that would have been in that field, Mm -hmm. in this field. That's right. You didn't beat 80 or 100 of the most legendary fishermen on earth. And you can't become my new hero if you don't become better than my old heroes by beating them. That's right. Like, that's the bottom. That's my whole point. It has been since the tour split was Bassmaster was in a bind. Because you can sit here and tell me they're going to make new greats of the sport. yeah. They're going to make new names, whatever. How are they going to make those new names if they're not beating all the legends? If they're not beating KVD, Hackney, Iconelli, Skeet Reese, you know, Brian Thrifdow, like on and on and on and on down the line. Oh, yeah, like if, <laughs> if you're not beating that roster, then how are you now the best? You didn't beat the best. Like, bro, you can win the minor league World Series every year. You're not the world champs. That's right. You're not. Like, whoever wins the XFL championship is not better than the Chiefs. They're not. No. They're not. not. You have to – the Chiefs are the best football team on earth because they beat the Patriots and they they beat the Ravens. and they. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Like, they beat the 49ers, like, in the Super Bowl. Like, they beat the best in the world. That's why they are the best. You can't become the best unless you beat the established best – no discredit to these guys. There's a lot of amazing – I mean, Lee Lofsey's on here. He's a Lake Fort local. I know how good he is. Mm-hmm. I watched him for years how good he was. He's unbelievably good. I think he could have had success in the old Elite Series format had he qualified at that time. Mm-hmm. But he didn't. That's right. And until he beats those guys that are on that other tournament trail, he's not going to be one of the best on earth in my opinion. And neither is anybody else on this tournament trail. Yeah. Besides the 10 to 15 that were doing it before everybody left. 
Right. So let's read some names. All right. So uh, I'll just give some names. Well, and just go from the top. Hank Cherry won. Hank Cherry won. Stetson got second. Stetson got third. Todd Otten got second. Todd Otten got second. That's right. Seth Fighter at fourth. Micah Frazier at fifth. See, and that's another one. Like Seth Fighter, he's great, and he did do it against the full mm -hmm. uh, old elite series wrestler for like one year, though. Yeah. Like I would have liked to have seen him like mature against those guys because now I don't know how good is Seth Fighter. Right. Is he really better than all those guys, or was he going to have one little good beginning and then be a mediocre elite series guy? Like we'll never know. Right. Which you know you've seen it in the past with several guys. Oh yeah, yeah. show up, boom, hot, fade. Right. Um, I said Michael Frazier at fifth. Again, I'd like to see him against the old roster. Right. Because. John Cruz Jr. I mean, John Cruz. John's was. legit. Brandon Lester at seventh. Lee Livesay at eight. There you go. Brandon Card at ninth. Matt Heron at tenth. Heron's been around forever. He's done it against the big guys. But, you know, to my point, mm -hmm. Heron has done it against the big guys, but he's not like a top 15 or 20 guy on earth. No. He never was. Right. Like, Matt Heron's good fisherman. Mm -hmm. He's very, very good. And he won a couple, he won at least one tournament I know of against the full Elite Series field back in the day. Yeah. Uh, at least one, probably more than one. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. But what I'm saying is he wasn't like a week in, week out contender. He wasn't right. an angler of the year contender. Like he just he's not one of the best on earth. Right. Jason Williamson at eleventh. Jason Williamson's been around for a little Who, while. Speaking of one that Pete and was Great. Yes. And then faded. There's one right there. Mm -hmm. Hey, over the last five years, Jason Williamson, I love watching him. He's a fun dude to watch, and he's a good fisherman. But no fish in. He's got, you're not in the top 20 over the last five years, Jason Williamson. You're not one of the top 20 fishermen in the world. You're not. Right. Skylar Hamilton at 12th. Don't know who that is. Don't even know who that is. <laughs> David Mullins at 13th. Keith Combs at 14th. He's legit. He's legit. He's legit. Yeah. <laughs> So we've got so far. So let me see that list real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So we've got. Uh, I think we've named off six. Stetson, Seth Fighter, John Cruz, Matt Heron, Keith Combs. Is that dangerous? Chris Zaldane is at 16. John Cox is at 21. Hunter Shryock is at 25. So after the top 25 of all the guys that qualified for the last day, that's all the names that out of belong, that list that belong with that, that list. I would say belong in the list of the best that would have normally been in a classic field. Right. I mean, you can't argue the facts. I, that's what it is, dude. Like, if you still had all those other guys fishing the Elite Series last year, the rest of those names probably wouldn't even be in this field to begin with. Exactly. So and, my point is... <laughs> The Classic is considered the Super Bowl and the biggest tournament in bass fishing. That's right. But how much longer can we call it the biggest trophy in bass fishing when you're not beating the best to win it? How can it be the Super Bowl when you got a bunch of XFL teams in the playoffs? I mean, I... I like, if you had the I NFL mean, playoffs, okay, and there was... How many teams go to the NFL playoffs? 16? Let's say there's yeah. 16 teams in the NFL playoffs. I don't know how many it is. Let's say there's 16. I don't think there's that many. We, we're, we're not very good football fans. <laughs> Let's say there's 16 teams in the NFL playoffs. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chris? Okay. I think there's 12, actually. Yeah, there's 12. 12. No, okay, think about it. there's 12 teams in, in the NFL playoffs. And based on those percentages, eight or nine of them are XFL teams. Two or three of them are regular NFL teams. Not the Chiefs. Right. But you got the Texans, and you got uh, – give me a middle-of-the-road NFL team. Because the Texans are a pretty good team. I'm I'm, I'm pretty terrible football fan. Then you take a middle-of-the-road team the like – Seahawks. Yeah, Seahawks are pretty good, I would say. A middle-of-the-road team like the Arizona Cardinals. Cardinals. That's good so one. you got the Texans, you got the Arizona Cardinals, and then you got the Cleveland Browns. Because yeah. out of the old elite series, that's basically what you got. You got – a couple of them that are real, real good mm -hmm. that were at the top of the game then. You got a couple of them that were kind of in the middle of the pack, and then you got a couple of them that were kind of towards the bottom of the run. Mm -hmm. So let's say you have nine XFL teams and the Texans and the Cardinals and the Browns. And I would call Hank Cherry 
a Cardinals, mm -hmm. a middle of the road yep. type of elite series angler. Mm -hmm. Maybe a little bit better than that. He's probably a little bit above, but not, not in the top right. third or 25%. He's in limbo. He's probably, if you did a percentage base of all the elite series anglers on the old roster, he's probably around the 40% mark. Right. Pro he's probably in the 40th percentile. I would agree. So the Cardinals just won the Super Bowl against the Texans and the Browns and nine XFL teams. That's what just happened. Now, are they the best? Did they just win the biggest fishing tournament on the planet? Did they just win the Super Bowl? Or did they win something that's dressed up like a Super Bowl but really doesn't have the same meaning? Yeah. I'm with you in the sense of I mean, it needs to be looked at differently. How long are we going to call it the Super Bowl of bass fishing? I, I think those days are numbered. I, I Unless something that. changes, I think those days are numbered. I mean, the the ball is in in Bass's court. I mean, most definitely. Well, I don't think the ball is in Bass's court anymore. I think the ball is in MLF court to create something as prestigious as the Classic because they have the NFL roster. Yeah, no, I agree with you, but I still think that there's going to be a mass exit. Like from the MLF to yeah, I, I really do think that now, you're going to see. That's a whole other thing. Next year, Swindle and Polinick qualify for the classic. That's a couple more really big names yeah, that really yeah. matter in the sport. Uh, and then if they get more the year following that, it could eventually come back to being the classic classic. I think in three to four years, you're going to see some anglers like the Iconellis and stuff. And yeah, you're yeah. Gonna no, see there's going to be some that are going to come back. Yeah. I also think though that from what I've seen so far through the first couple of events this year and everything that's going on, I think that MLF is working extremely hard to address uh, some of their, yeah, I guess flaws or, or perceived flaws anyway, whether right. they are or they aren't. Right. Uh, you know, inside the fish community, there's perceived flaws with the MLF. I think they're working really hard to resolve some of that. I think there may be not quite as many people leave as we think because if they improve things drastically in year two, there's going to be a lot of guys that want to stick around for year three and see how much more better it gets, so forth and so on. So, um, Well, I definitely can't argue with the fact that MLF caters to their, to their players, so to speak. In a much better well, they did some stuff that changed the whole sport. We've talked right. this blue in the face, but I mean, as far as the no entry fee and all, they changed everything and made everything better for every tour level tournament fisherman on earth. Yeah, they absolutely. really made leaps and bounds steps to do that. And right. I just think they are striving to really make their tournament the best, their, their trail the best it can be, make their television program the best it can be, make their live stream the best it can be. And if they can do all those things and get anywhere close to the production value that Bass has with the roster they have, and they can consistently catch the big fish like they have been so far. It's a wrap. <laughs> Done deal, Bass. Sorry yeah. for you bad luck. Yeah, but the you Red lost. Crest is going to be. You lost. Yeah. Like, like if the Red Crest starts happening at Lake Gunnersville and they start catching eight pounders, like, and it's Edwin and Kevin and you, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, yeah. If it's all them guys doing it, like. If, Let me just ask if, you, Jacob, what would you rather watch? <laughs> it, listen, all it's going to take is one. I don't even know where the Red Crest is going to be next year. But let's just say it's at Gunnersville because they just had the classic at Gunnersville. So let's make it the same playing field to make everything even. Fair. So let's say the Red Crest next year goes to Gunnersville. And let's say you have Jacob Wheeler, okay, and Kevin Van Dam, okay, and give me one more name that you really like. On the MLF? Yeah. I mean, it's a name uh, you really like watching. Just one guy that you really enjoy watching. Name Jason, Jason Christie. Jason Crick, great name, great name. And I'll throw Edwin Evers in there. So let's see, you got Jacob Wheeler, Kevin Van Dam, Jason Christie, and Edwin Evers. And these four guys are on Gunnersville, okay? And they've been duking it out. Every fish counts, reset it, start over, duke it out. Every And these four guys have survived to the final day. And we're on the final day of a Red Crest Championship, and these dudes are throwing six- to eight-pound fish at each other, counting every one of them, and they're catching a five-pounder and a four-pounder and a three-pounder and an eight-pounder, and it, the scoreboard's going like this with that buzzer-beater deal all the way to the end of the period. Dude, one event like that, and the Classic's over. I agree. One red crest like that, and the classic's done. Because mm -hmm. when you got those names, when you got Edwin, Kevin, Jacob, Jason, Chris, when you got those names going, first name guys. I say Edwin, who do you think of? Right. Yeah. Nobody. I say Hank, who do you think of? Cherry Williams Maybe? Jr. Like, well, <laughs> yeah. You know what you I'm know, saying? Absolutely. When I say Kevin, talking about bass fishing, you Van know Dan. who it is. Absolutely. Stetson, you know who it is because that's a very unique name. Correct. But if I say. Uh, Todd, 
Yeah, you're not gonna say fair cloth. Um, yeah, you're gonna say fair cloth. <laughs> like, yeah, is it, you talking about fair cloth? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, or Bobby? Yeah, like you. Exact. My, that's my point. Yeah. These are guys that we all know on a first name basis. You get three or four of those guys duking it out in every fish counts format, and they're throwing bigs on the board in one red crest event like that. Oh yeah, it's a wrap. Classics done, dude. Yeah. I mean, it'll never be done. It'll never. I don't think it'll go. But I would have never thought the Forestwood Cup would go away. And where is it? She gone. I'm just saying, folks, you can't – it's always in all sports, whether it's bass fishing and professional-level sports. Evolution. Whether it's about – whether it's bass fishing or football or baseball or soccer or golf or whatever it is, the Jimmys and Joes are more important than the X's and O's at the pro level. That's right. Because the at a certain level of any sport, there's a lot of guys that are really good. Oh, yeah. And it's the Jimmys and Joes that matter, not the X's and O's. And what I mean by that on a football field, we all know what plays everybody's running. You know, there's very few exceptions to that. There's very few new schemes that come out that surprise people. Right. It's about the Jimmys and Joes and them ex being more talented, hardworking, like execution. It's and, and then when it comes to selling a product and creating brand name recognition, it's definitely about the Jimmys and Joes. Oh, yeah. And there's no arguing that BPT has the Jimmys and Joes in spades, son. Uh, yeah, it's not even close. And, and not, <clears throat> you know, not to say that all these guys in the Elite Series couldn't compete with these guys. We're just never going to know. Right. Exa that's exactly right. It's not that they're not good enough fishermen. It's that they're not getting the opportunity to compete against the established best. So that's the problem. That that okay. I just wanted to clear that yes. up so everybody yes. didn't think. That I, well, I just I said it earlier. Lee Lofsey from Lake Fork. I know how good he is. I've seen him do it right. on a day to day basis for years. Mm -hmm. I've seen him be the most consistent big fish catching dude in this region yeah. for years. I've seen that happen. I have all the faith in what I told everybody. When Lee went to the Elite Series and all the other guys were gone, I'm like, dude, he's fixing really do and he's done really well. Yes. I thought that he could have competed against the old roster. Yeah, for sure. I told everybody that before. I, I think that he's good enough to compete against the BPT roster. I think he is. But we'll, it sucks that we're not going to see it. It sucks mm -hmm. that we're not going to know. You know what else I'll be anxious to see, too, is whenever uh, – because, I mean, it's inevitable. You're going to have some guys leave that BPT deal. I'll be anxious to see who they go and try and grab. Yeah. And I think it's some of those names that we just talked about, honestly. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think they'll try to get John Cox. Yeah. Because he's a hot name. They're um, going to try and get Stetson. But the other thing is, too, as guys start to leave, they're going to set up the establish the qualifying deal through the FLW. There's still a lot of good fishermen on FLW. Oh, yeah. Some really solid ones that'll. And here's what's getting. You want to talk about making some new names? Take some guy that you've never heard of that's fishing the FLW tour right now because there's plenty of that. Right. And let him come spank up on some BPT dudes. Like, we've heard of him because we're from here. Right. Daryl Gleason at Toledo Bend. Right. Who had a great FLW opening event on Rayburn. Mm-hmm. Take a guy like Daryl Gleason, who's been in the game for a long time. Daryl's got to be close to his 40s. He's in the upper 30s for sure. I would say he's a little bit older than me, I think. Mm-hmm. I think so, that's right. So he's got to be getting close to 40, I would think. But somebody that the rest of the nation's never heard of. Right. But he's a guy on Toledo Bend, been a local tournament hammer for a long time. Really good guy, really good fisherman. Well, he goes and fish the FLW tour, and then he qualifies in the BPT. And then he goes up there, and he lays the wood to Kevin and Wheeler and Jordan Lee. And now, all of a sudden, Daryl Gleason is a household name across the country. That's right. Just like that. Overnight. And <sighs> the guys that are meanwhile, fishing. Meanwhile, Kelly J.E., not Kelly Jordan, but Kelly J I J A Y E, who is a great fisherman Absolutely. and could compete on the old Elite Series, in my opinion. Agreed. Yep. Nobody knows who he is. Right. Other than hardcore fans. Right. I, you know what? Hardcore the, fans know who he is. That's nobody else knows who he is. That's funny. I, it's funny you say that because somebody the other day was like, "Yeah, I wonder how, I wonder how Kelly's gonna J or Kelly J's gonna do on this event." And I said, "Dog, he's on he's on Best Pro Tour." And he goes, "No, J, not Jordan." And I was like, "Oh." But that strengthens, -E. yeah, that strengthens exactly. the point, right? There. What do you say Kelly J in the bass fishing world? That's you right. think of Kelly Jordan. That's right. I couldn't say it better myself. Yeah. Let's move on because we, we, we went <laughs> on that one for a while. So let's move on to the event that's coming up this week, the event of my century, my life, my year. Oh, boy. Because for the first time in ever. You're heroes of the sport. All of the biggest names, the best roster in fishing that has ever been assembled 
is coming to my home lake, the Goat Lake, the greatest trophy bass fishery of all time. They're coming this week. The Goat Squad is coming to the Goat Lake. Yeah. They, yeah. They should have named that deal. <laughs> they should have named it the Goat Pro Tour. <laughs> the Goat Pro Tour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is going to be an interesting deal because they've got this Every Fish Counts format, which creates a whole new dynamic. Fork is not, in my opinion, really a numbers lake these days. It can be. It has its moments where it can be. Yeah, not this time of year, though, especially. Even this time of year. It has it. I, there I is it a way be. to fish it for numbers. Right. Oh, not something I've ever done because I've always looked at Lake Fork because I'm going there to catch one. That's right. You know, that's kind of how I've adopted it and fished it. That, that's been my mentality. But... It's going to be really interesting to see how these guys break it down. And it's a big fish time of year, as you alluded to. I mean, you still can fish for numbers, but this is primarily a big fish time of year. Not as many bites. Um, I was trying to think. On and, the- and most of the time we say it's easier to catch. It's a lot easier to catch four two-pounders than it is to catch one eight-pounder. But on Lake Fort, this time of year, it's kind of not. Yeah, no, it ain't. It's kind of not. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> like, <laughs> I was thinking on the way over here. I was like, you know what? I'm thinking to myself, I wonder... I, I started thinking about what weights it's going to take. Oh, man. And, just, and, and I was spinning myself out, yeah, dude. But you can't do that because it could, there's such a wide range on what it could be. I know. That's like, what I'm saying. With all the flooding and muddy water, and it's, the water's still a little bit colder. Like It, it could be kind of tough on them numbers-wise. And it might only take 30, 40, 50 pounds a day to, to lead your, your period, right. to lead your day. I was just trying to come up with a formula, and I was like, "Man, there's so many factors involved, and there's so many big right." Fish. Something like, like something like ten to fifteen fish for forty to fifty pounds could win your day, right? But if somebody rolls up on the right point and gets the big bait bite figured out, and rolls up on the right point at the right time, it could be something like they could have five for thirty-five in it. It could be like something that day could be something like fifteen to twenty fish for a hundred and something pounds. Yeah. I know. Like, somebody could catch 150 pounds of bass in a single day. Oh, yeah. That could happen. That could happen. Pretty rare this time of year to catch enough numbers to get that high. Like, it's going to be hard for somebody to go out and catch 30 or 40 bass, which is what you have to do to get 150 pounds. Right. You have to go out and catch 30 bass minimum. That's a five-pound average at 30 bass. That's right. Like, you're going to have to, even on Lake Fort, you're going to have to catch at least 30 bass to get to 150 pounds if you do everything right. But it could happen... Like, somebody hits the right point two or three times a day at the right time, and all of a sudden they've got 40 fish for 150 pounds. I wouldn't be surprised at all if somebody's single-day weight goes over 100 pounds in this deal, even though it's not a numbers time of year. 100 pounds wouldn't surprise me a bit. What I'm anxious to see is how many of these guys are going to catch um, seven, eight fish bags that are over 50 pounds. Six, It'll happen. Or over 60 pounds. Hey. Where, where a best five bag would have been a 40-pound sack, you know? Like, that could happen. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I, I really don't even think it's on a limb. There will be a Sri Lanka caught in this event. That's a limb. A 13-pounder? Has there ever been I don't believe so. a 13-pounder caught in a tour-level event? I don't believe so. I've seen some high 11s. Maybe there, Maybe back in the, the Dean Rojas Toho deal, he might have caught one over 13. That, may, that would make sense because he had the single-day weight record. He had like record. 45 pounds one yeah. day. I don't know. We need to I'd do some to research that. on yeah. that. Comment below if you know, has there ever been a 13-plus caught in a tour-level event? We're talking FLW Pro Tour level, Bassmaster yeah, Elite yeah. Series, or we know it hasn't happened yet in the Bass Pro Tour. We know that hasn't happened yet. Yeah. That would be crazy. I mean, it could happen. It could. It could happen. I mean, for sure, there's going to be multiple double digits caught. Oh, yes, yeah, for like, sure. There's going to be multiple 10-pounders caught in oh, this yeah, event. No doubt. I would be I'd be shocked, shocked if there wasn't. If there wasn't multiple yep. double digits, I agree, job. dude. I'm telling you. And and I want to say I want to state this for the record: Fork has not been fishing good. No, yeah, it's been tough. It is not, but I think it's about to get good. Like me saying Fork's going to fish good for these guys is total forecasting based on the full moon being tomorrow, warm nights at the beginning of the week. They're going into now. The one thing that can't happen is if this rain that we've got forecasted picks up volume and intensity, it could screw this whole deal up, right? And make it real, real tough. Because if we get a whole bunch more rain, we've already had a bunch. Like, it's just going to get tough. It's going to spread everything out, put them in flood. It's just going to – water color's going to change. They're going to open up all the gates. Like, it's going to get tough if we get a lot of rain this week. It will get tough. That's right. And we do have rain in the forecast every day, but it's all light rain. Yeah. 
right now. Right. <laughs> but it's Texas. Yeah. So we reserve the right to show you all four seasons in one day at any given time. Hey, if you ain't seen 90 degrees in early March, Texas says, I got you. Hold my beer. Or if you haven't seen 50s in July. That's right. We'll do that sometimes, too. Like, Hey, we might did, snow on Easter. <laughs> it might be 50 degrees one morning, and then by the next afternoon, it'll be 110. Like, that's, that's right. That, yeah, it might snow in April and May. Like, we've had that. Like, you never know what you're going to get weather-wise here. So, I, Did I'm telling you, though? I, I I don't know why I think that. I just really do think that there will potentially be a Sharon Liquor caught. Well, it's full. Listen. Y'all heard it here first. Full moon in March, like we said, it's tomorrow. A few days later, they start the tournament. There's no better time to catch a share lunker than That's around right. the full moon in March. That's right. That's traditionally over the years, over all the share lunkers that have been turned into the program, Lake Fork around the full moon in March is the number one time to catch a share lunker. I wouldn't be surprised to see it happen. So, it, I just wonder if enough people are going to fish, uh, which, you know, you can catch share lunkers on the shallow point. Well, so go ahead and say what you're going to say. I'm going to follow it up. Go but, ahead. It'll be it'll be funny to see how many people fish for bites that big, specifically bites that big, because you know as well as anybody to go to go up against a double digit fish to fish for that fish. You fish completely different than you're gonna fish for a seven pounder. Like it's just it's just facts. You can certainly increase your odds of catching double digit by fishing differently. Exactly. And these guys aren't gonna fish that way. They can't. No, but there's going to be people that get... Not in this tournament. They can't. They can't go targeting giants. They, go have, they have to go catch... They, go ha, they have to go catch three and four to seven and eight pound fish in numbers. That's what they have to do. Right. They have to go catch numbers of four to seven, eight pound fish. That's what they have to do. If I'm running out of time and I'm 10 pounds from the cut line... Yeah, but you're not going to commit your whole day to trophy hunting. No. Which is what you have to do to increase those odds. Well, that's true. But Doing it for an hour is not going to make any difference. I mean, maybe. I've maybe, seen crazier things. You, it would just still be a tremendous stroke of luck to fit to target one for an hour and catch 100%, it. One hundred percent. But who better to execute? Here's that? my point on that. <laughs> my point to that is when you have dirtier water, rising water like we've had, it positions some of these freak of nature teenage class fish in normal yep. fishing areas. Um, the biggest fish that's been caught out of Lake Fork over the last several years we had about maybe five years ago i believe it was mr james quisenberry caught a 16 pounder on live bait out deep mm -hmm. but since then the biggest one that's been caught the last three four five years has been a 15 pounder that was caught on a black and blue jig in about three to four foot of water flipping just flipping a piece of standing timber with a black and blue jig now do you know what the conditions were when this happened similar to these dirty rising early to mid-march slightly cold water early spawning time rising water dirty water pull that 15 pounder from spawning in six foot seven foot of water because what happens is over the years with all the pressure these big giant fish that get just tremendously huge spawn deeper than you can see them they don't That's spawn right. very rarely will you see a 13 pound fish spawning where you can see i sight fish lake fork as much as anybody on planet earth over the last five years period nobody's done it more than i have not being arrogant just that's just fact i've done i'm as adamant about sight fishing as anybody and i fish as much as anybody on planet earth on lake fork i have looked at more beds on lake fork than anybody else over the last for sure the last three or four years mm -hmm. i've never seen what i thought was a 13 pounder on a bed never i've seen some 10s some 11s some 12s i've caught 10s and 11s mm -hmm. you know off beds um they just spawn deeper than what you can see. That's right. But what happens is when you get water rising in dirty water, you can't see in three foot of water anymore. That's right. You can't see in two foot of water. And so that fish that normally would have been out six, seven foot of water where you can't see it, okay, and behind where you're going to be fishing, mm -hmm. even if you're just doing normal fishing this time of year, you're fishing in three or four foot of water or less. Most of the time, most people are. The yep. numbers of people are fishing in two foot of water, three foot of water, four foot of water. Mm -hmm. That's about as deep as they're fishing this time of year. That's right. Well, now that big 13, 14, 15 pounder can get in those type of areas because of the dirty rising water. And it gives a lot of people a chance to make that fish make a mistake. He sees a lot more baits than he would if he was in six, seven foot of water. So to your point, 
I don't think it's going to be a guy, if, if it gets caught, it's not going to be a guy targeting a giant like, going, okay, I'm swinging for the fences. I'm trying to catch the biggest fish in the lake. Right. It's going to be a guy that just catches him on accident. He's going to be going along flipping, catching some fish in a shallow water area, or be a shallow on a point and throw a big swim bait on it. Like He's just going to be doing normal fishing stuff. And one of them biggins is going to push a little shallower because that water's dirty and rising, and it's going to be that's what that's how it's going to happen. And there's not a better assembly of anglers. Oh yeah, to fish all that normal stuff that the everyday angler fishes. They know, and they're going to, and they'll execute at a much higher rate. I was just fixing to say they're going to. They'll execute at a much more efficient rate. A lot more. That is going to be. I I just think I don't know for for whatever reason in my mind it just. I'm excited. Well, there's a lot of a lot of places fun to go in your mind with this tournament because of the time of year it is. It, to me, I think it's as fun building up, thinking about it, leading up to it, absolutely, as it's going to be watching it all. Oh, the hype leading up to it is as good as any of it. Like I'm so excited for this tournament because just all the stars. Well, it's not. And listen, it's not ideal. Like I said, it has been fishing tough, but there's a lot of things working in the positive this week that could could make it a great event with like we, we've said it i beat it over the head tonight but warm nights every night leading in the tournament is 58 or higher so the water's gonna be warm trending all week full moon to pull them in tomorrow night uh cloudy conditions which is going to make them shallow fish get even more shallow and active um dirty water which is going to push them up on the banks rising water push them up on the banks like a lot of things are going our way mm. To make it the potential for this tournament, the the potential for this tournament is scary to think about. Uh, it's mind boggling to think about what could happen. Now, one thing I've learned about Lake Fork over the years, oftentimes when you think A, B, and C is lined up, she'll go over there and say, "No, it's Z, Y, X." That's right. <laughs> she can be tough when she has no reason to. Like there's some of them days when you walk out and it's like if you read the bass fishing books, we're fixing to whack them and you can't hardly buy a bite. Like I've seen that happen on Lake Fork. So I'm reserving my promises and guarantees on anything other than I'm really excited for this tournament. There's a lot of things that could potentially be amazing and awesome and I cannot wait to see how it all unfolds. Yeah, it's exciting. And she she will. Mother Fork will definitely humble you. Oh man. I've never seen a lake that's as temperamental as far as like you can be on the deal. Oh, yeah. You can be on the deal catching 30-pound bags two or three days in a row. The next day, run back to that same water with the exact same conditions. Nothing's changed. Everything's perfectly stable and not get a bite on that pattern. And you're like, uh, what do I do now? <laughs> I don't know what to do in bass fishing when I have all the same conditions and I can't get the same bites. Right. You know what I mean? Because okay. everything we know in bass fishing is... Okay, if you have these conditions, do this. If you have these conditions, do that. And then once you dial it in and really figure it out and you're whacking them, you're like, okay, if I get these same conditions tomorrow, I get the same wind direction, the same wind speed, the same cloud cover, the same water temperature, everything's the same. I'm going to catch them again tomorrow doing that. Yeah, it's a lather, rinse, repeat deal for sure. Like that's like bass aren't smart enough to change their mind. Right. They're just not supposed to be. But somehow on Fort, sometimes they just – disappear on you like they just totally and they don't even disappear they just quit biting like i've never seen another lake as, as fickle and finicky uh on that type of deal as four kids i'll never forget something you told me one day we were talking about fishing and i said something about uh i, I believe one along the lines of i said man them bass are just them bass are smart in that lake and you said listen there is no such thing as a smart They're not bass. smart. They're, They're not, not smart. That, yeah, he said, hey, he, Billy tells me, have you ever ate a plastic hamburger? Have you ever ate a metal hot dog? And I said, well, no. And he goes, well, these idiot fish do it every single day. So there is nothing smart about them. They're not smart animals. And so that's, when it's tough on me, that's what I try and remind myself. Like, okay, you just got to yeah. expand and broaden your horizons. And They're not smart. The problem is we don't live underwater. And right. we don't understand every little intricate detail. But to that point, that's what makes Fork kind of a unique deal and really confusing to me at times is I can have all the same stuff. Right. Like all the same conditions where they should bite the same thing again and they don't. And that confuses the best of us. Like when that, ha okay. that, that happens on Fork and when it happens, you're just like, uh. <laughs> then you just start tying on different baits and throwing the kitchen sink at them yeah. and pray something sticks, you know, because I mean that. Well, it's just like sometimes, you know, they'll be keyed in on Gizzard Chad and then the next day it's Bluegill and you're like, yeah. why? There's a, and listen, there's people, you know, I've had people ask me a couple times this year already. It's kind of a unique, I didn't used to get this question very often, but I've thought about this a lot 
with you know living here and fishing Lake Fork for the last ten years like I have so adamantly. Uh, that's something that maybe not everybody knows is that you know I just started guiding here. This is my fifth year guiding, I think, something like that. You going on number six, aren't you? I don't know. Something like I don't I know. Did, anyway, anyway, I, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, all the days run together. <laughs> Well, I guess, I guess, yeah, I think I started part-time guiding in 2015, I think. That's right. Uh, anyway. Yeah, nonetheless. So, people have known that I was around the lake since then, mm -hmm. but what most people don't know is for since 2000, the beginning of 2010, the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, I have fished this lake religiously, and I mean religiously mm -hmm. fished this lake every spare chance I've had, so... Uh, in that time, over that 10 years, I've had a lot of time to sit and kind of think about and internally analyze what is it that makes Lake Fork so different? Because, folks, make no mistake about it. If you've never been to Lake Fork or you're watching this tournament, you've never heard of Lake Fork or whatever the case may be, you've heard about it and you know it kicked out some big fish, but you really don't know the full history of it. Let me explain one thing to you right now. No other lake, no other lake. In the history, and this is there's data to back this up. This ain't just a homer bragging on his favorite pond. No other lake in the history of bass fishing has kicked out the number and consistently kicked out the number of trophy bass that Lake Forecast. Facts. It is a special place. We call it the Goat Lake because there's no other place like it. In the history of the Texas Share Lunker program, over half of the fish in the program came from one lake. The rest of the state combined can't keep up with what this one lake does in producing 13 plus pound fish and then if you want to go to 10 pounders it does that if you want to go to the top 50 all-time caught like 37 of the top 50 fish ever caught in the state of texas were caught at lake fork okay put okay it, put it in perspective there was just a 49 pound bag caught on rayburn still isn't as good a trophy fishery as lake fork that was the biggest tournament bag ever weighed in the state of texas but it's still do you know how many 50 pound bags have been caught out of lake fork oh yeah they just weren't because we don't have tournaments. Because like, we never had tournaments because of the slot limit. Like, that's right. That's what's so amazing about Lake Fork is there's never been the tournament, the big national level exposure on it. So people don't really, for all the legend talk of it, unless you're here and you really think about what's going on, you don't really realize how special this place is. Okay, think about this, folks. They've been fishing Lake Sam Rayburn, Lake Gunnersville, Lake Okeechobee, Clear Lake, uh, Lake Falcon. These big tours have been fishing those many times for years and years and years and years and years. Mm -hmm. Last year was the first time the Bassmasters ever came to Lake Fork. Mm -hmm. Now we got BPT, Bassmasters is coming back. But there was four years where they fished something called the Toyota Texas Bass Classic. Mm -hmm. Look at the weights. In fact, there was only two years that they fished a best five format. I'm sorry, there was four years. They did it back in like 2006, 2007, or 2007, 2008. They did it. That's right. But it was a team combined event. It wasn't your traditional best five right. format. There was two years where they had an individual tournament with some of the best fishermen on planet Earth, 2014 and 2015. Best five counted. You weighed them in the boat, but you got to count all your slot fish. Best five mm -hmm. counted. Um, 2014 was the best, and it was a three-day event. And these were the top like 25 from FLW, top 25 from Bassmaster, something something along those lines. Yeah. It's 40 or 50 guys, some of the best fishermen on planet Earth, tour level type event. Mm -hmm. Small field, but two in three days, not four. It took 110 pounds in three days. Folks, that is the greatest three days of best five tournament fishing that's ever been recorded. 100%. And they've only done it on four, three times. They've only fished that type of format on tour level three times ever in the history of bass fishing. How many times have they fished Rayburn? 30, 40, 50? Oh, yeah. Maybe more? Ton. How many times they fish Gunnersville? 100? Like, Okeechobee, 100? They fished three times on Lake Fork, and the best three days of tournament fishing weight ever accumulated in a best five format on a tour level event is at Lake Fork. It's a special, special place. Dude, I'm going to, after this uh, tournament goes down, I'm going to go through and I'm going to try and find, there's a way to break down every fish caught for every angler. I want to sort out best five bags. 
and I want to see. That would be tough to do, but yeah, you could do it if you I, really I'm dug sure, into it. I'm sure the information's there. If you dug into it, you could do it, but that would be a tough deal to do. Um, because that would just back, that would back the yeah. comparison, like 100%, and we could just well, be like, gonna look, get, here it is. <laughs> and we're going to get a best five format come early June. That's right. Best Masters will be here uh, first weekend, in, like June 2nd or something And make like no so. mistake about it, they're going to catch some weight. They're going to catch some weight. Like, as long as nothing, like last year, they would have caught 30 pounds a day for sure. But the weather, they it like the lake literally just like what happened in Guntersville. The yep. lake flood. Here's here's a good comparison for you. Guntersville, arguably one of the best tournament fishing bass fishing lakes in the history of bass fishing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can make a case for it to be way high on the list for sure. I wouldn't argue with it no one bit. Yeah, I wouldn't either. Guntersville just had uh, a lot of heavy rain, some flooding conditions right before the tournament started. Right. That's right. Uh, they caught the average of twenty pounds a day for best five. Won it. Right? Mm-hmm. Last year, Lake Fork in May. Same fish do. Fish don't weigh as much in May as they do in March, by the way. Correct. They don't weigh as much in, in May as they do in March. No. Lake Fork had tremendous flooding the night before the tournament. The night before the tournament. It still took 28 to 29 pound average over four days to win it. 115 pounds over four days. So, Gunnerville Fork. Still eight to nine pounds a day better with flooding conditions than they put the tournament. I'm here to tell you, when, our, when the our, fish cus- skinnier. our customers were catching 30 pounds a day on their best five leading up to that event. If that if they would have fished that tournament the four days before they actually fished it last year, that 130 pounds at Lake Falcon was done. It was gone. I mean, literally, our guide customers were catching 30 pound bags yeah. almost every day. Right. And then we had that flood and it got tougher. But those guys, being who they are, they're really good fishermen, they, they figured it out. Yeah. You know, good Which, good amount we, of them figured it out and caught a lot of big fish. So it, it is what it is, man. The, I mean, people can say, well, Lake Fork's not what it used to be. There's a lot of lake. Like, I hear this I hear this quite a bit. Lake, lake Fork is uh, not as good as it used to be. It's still better than anything else. 100%. For big bass, it's still the best on earth. Where I was originally going with all this before I got off on my roller coaster, <laughs> went chasing a big old squirrel. Yeah, that's, that's like a Randy Ragged. Um, the reasons that Lake Fork is so good, there's a lot of them, and I've thought about it a lot. And the reasons that Lake Fork is so good, A, is because Texas Parks and Wildlife put a lot of time you know, and effort into making it good. But you had kind of a perfect uh, scenario here. What you had was you had very fertile land to start with, thick, lush forest. E- Northeast Texas, where Lake Fork sits, is gets as much rainfall as you can get without being considered a rainforest on Earth. Out of anything that's not considered a rainforest, Northeast Texas is as wet of a climate that's as right. there is. Uh, very thick, lush, dense forestry around here. Um, very fertile ground. Very fertile ground. A lot of good farming areas, a lot of fertile soil, uh, fertile grass, all that stuff. So you build a lake in a fertile environment. Great. Also, the contour changes. A lot of contour changes. It's just not a big flat bowl. Okay. Um, That creates, obviously, a lot of natural structure. Then you leave all the timber in the lake. That creates a lot of cover. Right. For years and years and years, when they filled Lake Fork up, there was... The majority of the lake was unfishable. You couldn't get through all the treetops and timber. So there was fish that lived their entire lives and never saw a boat. And you got to create this huge population of fish that had an overabundance of bait and got to grow as big as they could possibly grow that never saw a lure, never knew a fisherman existed for a generation of fish. Okay? That was the base of it right there. That's how we got so many... That's how the lake... A, the ground was naturally fertile, but B, the fish were protected, and they didn't get messed with. And so you had this huge population of bait from, you had a huge brim population, you had a huge shad population, you had a huge crappie population, uh, yellow bass went crazy in there. Like, you had all these different types of bait fish that these bass love to eat, just huge populations. On top of that, Texas Parks Wildlife did a great job of stocking pure Florida genetics in the ponds that flooded when the lake filled up, there was a bunch of ponds that flooded. Mm-hmm. Well, Texas Parks and Wildlife contracted out these ponds and put pure Florida strain bass in these ponds before the lake filled up. So as soon as the lake filled up over the ponds, the lake had a bunch of Florida strain bass mm-hmm. automatically. And then they kept stocking the Florida strain in there as well. On top of that, through the Sherlanka program and through all the stuff that Texas Parks and Wildlife was doing in the 80s. 
So great job to them there. This may be the biggest factor in all of it. When I look at all these other big legendary fisheries, like Big Sam, Toledo Bend, mm -hmm. Falcon, Gunnersville, I look at all these big legendary fisheries. They all have uh, a river. They all have a lot of current, especially when you get high water situations, a lot of current rips through the lake. When you have a lot of current ripping through the lake, grass gets ripped out, nutrients, health, life source of the lake, plankton, all funnels out of the lake. Lake Fork is the biggest lake that has no river. So it's just basically rain runoff and backwoods creeks that fill up Lake Fork. Mm -hmm. um, I think that creates a situation where Lake Fork it keeps, keeps its, own. Yeah. its nutrients. Mm -hmm. It keeps a higher percentage of its nutrients in the lake, which creates a longevity and consistency with the trophy bass that grow in there, which is why you've seen Lake Fork do what it's done, continuing to produce these giant 10 plus pound bass year after, you know, 40 years later now, it's still kicking out all these giant 10 plus pound bass. Uh, and if you look at Rayburn, like Rayburn's hot the last couple of years mm -hmm. and it's kicking out giant bags. But there was a few years where Rayburn, you couldn't catch 20 pounds on Rayburn. That's right. That's never been the case on Lake Fork. Anytime slot fish count in a tournament on Lake Fork, it takes a big bag of fish. Oh, yeah. Hell, the God's tournaments that we fish in January, some of the toughest time of year, it never took less than 25 pounds to win with just 30 local guides fishing it. Mm -hmm. Often it was around 30. Like, it always takes a big bag of fish on Lake Fork. Always. And that's why it's so consistent. It keeps its nutrients. It has the perfect alignment of Florida strain bass, native cover, native structure, huge beginning base of bass and bait populations and the lake has kept its nutrients which helped it maintain those populations over the years uh there's a lot of things one other thing that's helped it really consistent water levels over the years uh it was built as a water source for dallas but the pump system that they built on there never got fully functional until about three or four years ago mm -hmm. So for the first 35 whatever years of the lake's life, no water ever got pulled out of it other than the runoff going through the spillway. Right. So a lot of, <laughs> lot of factors have basically, stars have aligned to make Lake Fork the greatest bass, trophy bass lake of all time. We've got the greatest bass fishing talent roster of all time colliding a few days after the full moon in March. Hence, all the big talk and all the excitement. And I'm really excited, Jack really excited about this it's gonna be a lot of fun i don't know how many times i've been graphing on lake fork and just seeing all the bait and be like dude these fish don't gotta eat what i'm throwing that's one thing about graphing on lake fork it don't do you any good to find bait because no. you can find it everywhere Jack. oh dude it's everywhere that is probably as healthy a bait that population was one of the toughest I've lessons seen. i had to learn was i'd go man look at all the bait out here on this point and i get all excited be like there's got to be some bass around i fish it nothing yep i don't even stop on bait anymore dude, like I'm you, you if i don't find a school of bass point. i ain't stopping because it just because there's tons of bait doesn't mean there's going to be bass there. There's tons of bait all over that lake. It's unbelievable. Really? The only time... <laughs> talk about stars aligning. Also, let's talk about this for a second. You know why Lake Fork can be so tough and so confusing sometimes? The stars align on that too. A, probably the highest percentage of pure floor strain bass in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. Floor strains are more temperamental than northern strains. Yep, that's right. Hands down, the most pressure per acre of any lake in the country, really, because Lake Fork's not big. It's only 27,000 acres. Lakes like Rayburn, over 100,000 acres. Falcon, 80,000 acres. Toledo Bend, 180,000 acres. Okeechobee, clear like big like that. You know, they're way over 100,000 acres. I don't know what they are. They're huge. Lake Fork's only 27,000 acres, and it has as big a reputation as all those lakes. That's right. So we get more pressure per acre, more pressure per bass than any other lake in the country. So you've got Florida strain bass that are temperamental. You got all this pressure, and they're never hungry. Never. The bait source is so unbelievable. These fish are, like a lot of times the reason we catch fish on reaction style baits and we throw chatter baits and lipless crank baits and deep diving crank baits and all that type of stuff, we're always trying to create reaction bites from these fish. Uh, and that's why I adopted that was because I came to this thought process years ago of, man, these fish are harder to catch than the rest of them. And you, you hear people say that, and when you start thinking about all these factors, it makes sense why. So I've always gone with, okay, I either got to finesse them or react them. I'd much rather get them to react than finesse. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what, but that's why those fish can be here today, gone tomorrow on Lake Fork. Because right. just like the stars line to make it a great fishery, the stars also kind of line to make it a little bit of a tough fishery. And some of the same things that make it great also make it tough. Um, 
and so that's kind of how all those things work together for me in my head. That's my theories on Lake Fork over the years, but there's no doubt, man. You got the greatest trophy bass fishery of all time with the greatest roster of all time about to hit it. They're all about to collide this week. Mm. And uh, I'm hoping that she shows up and shows out and everything. You know, I'm, I have a lot of Lake Fork pride, so I hope she shows off. But either way, I'm going to have, even if those guys struggle, I'm going to have fun watching that. Because I'm going to be like, I know how that feels. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, big dog? <laughs> but I don't think they will. I think they'll go out there and catch them. I think, you know, at least some of those guys will catch them extremely. I think there will be some that struggle. There'll be some big names that oh, yeah. have a hard time on Lake Fork. But I think for the most part, those guys will go out there and catch them. The ones at the top will really be whacking on them. And it should be a very fun show. I'm excited, man. God, I'm to excited. watch. It's going to be great. It is going to be great. Man, I think that's kind of it, dude. That's a lot of Lake Fort talk. That's a, a pretty long podcast episode. And I I, uh, I just can't wait to see what happens the rest of the week. I can't either. A um, little look forward. We were going to talk about this tonight. We ran out of time. My punishment will be announced on the next podcast. Well, no, we told the people we're going to do it. We need to do that. Chris. Explain why you suck so bad. Mm. <laughs> it is tough. That's a whole other episode in of itself, huh? Yeah, Lee, how much time y'all got? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, I just, you know, I, I zigged when I should have zagged and just didn't, I don't know, kind of spun myself out a little bit. Uh, yeah. Got about halfway through day one. And we had one in the box. Now, granted, it was a good one. Um, just didn't. Didn't make the changes that I should have made. And, you know, looking back, that's always the easiest way to look at it. But um, today was better. Day two was better. But, you know, I had dang near, dang near 20 leading it after day one. And I told my partner, I said, dude, we're going to have to catch. We're going to have to catch 30 to be even relevant. And, uh, yeah, that ended up not being the case. It didn't take 20 pounds for two days. It, it was fish tough. And I... <laughs> tell them about the tournament. Tell them about those guys that caught all that weight the first day, which made you think you had to really swing for it, and then they did. Then they just like zero. Were they zero? They zero today. Yep. So tell them about that because that was pretty wild. So the guys that were leading it after day one, I can't remember. It. Don't give me the line on the exact weight they had, but they were leading it after day one. Um, they didn't end up winning, but they zero today. They ended up in the money, but yeah, crazy. But that just goes to show you guys, <laughs> here one day, gone tomorrow. Some of them weren't even here today, and that's what I experienced on Saturday. <laughs> but I had, uh, you know, if I'd have landed, if I'd have landed the fish that I had pinned up at the end of today, we would have got paid. But I didn't. All of... right, I got the winner. <laughs> How much hair you got up under that hat? Not very much. I got the winner. Are we doing live Texas results? Kayak Adventures. I love it. You shave lightning bolts in his head if he does not top five, which you didn't. <laughs> and he has to wear pajamas and a Hawaiian shirt and purple Crocs for no win. So at your next tournament, you have to wear pajama pants, a Hawaiian shirt, and purple Crocs. Where the hell am I going to find purple Crocs? I don't know. ZW, ZW can I borrow some? Can we get some LSU Crocs, ZW? Uh, uh, our, our South Louisiana buddy, Zach Watts. You guys, if y'all watch the channel, know who that is. If you don't, start watching the channel, I guess. I don't know. Uh, the lightning bolts in the head, though. And here's the deal. I'm going to shave the lightning bolts in your head live on the podcast. That's fine. We're gonna, so we're going to do that. Have, we're going to have to do the podcast on a Friday then because I can't, I can't wear that to work. You lightning bolts? Yeah. Well, you have to wear the lightning bolts in the tournament, too. When's your next fine. tournament? That's what I'm saying. Uh, April 18th. And it's a two-day tournament. Thanks, guys. April 18th? And I got to wear that same outfit for two days. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't even going to enforce that. You're, you're just doing that out of the goodness of your heart because you're well, a good I mean, man. Hey, man of my word. So we're going we're gonna to meet up together. Actually, you don't, we don't do the podcast live, so what we'll do, we'll meet up together on Friday night do the lightning bolts. No word. You'll go fish your tournament in your jam pants and your Hawaiian shirt and your purple Crocs. Then we'll film the podcast, the rest of the podcast after that, but we'll do the segment. Uh, yeah. Actually, I think what we should do... <laughs> you going to come chase me around Pines and do live coverage? You going to do Bass Tracker? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if my kids didn't have a soccer game that day, I so would. Maybe on Sunday. But what I was going to say is what we should do is I should put the lightning bolts in your head, and we should film me putting the lightning bolts in your head at registration Saturday morning in the dark. 
That'd be good. Like right there in front of everybody, I'm putting the lightning bolts in your head. That'd be funny. But that's too far away, and I got a soccer game that morning. Lake of, Lake of Pines is a ways away from your house. It's, it's a little definitely bit of a, a ways from my house. <laughs> so we might not, that would be great if we could make that happen. But uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll just have to see. Maybe we'll do it we'll, Sunday. We'll morning. find a way to get it done. We'll figure sure. that out. We're gonna film the lightning bolts going in your head. You're gonna we're gonna get footage of you. You got to get footage of yourself wearing the Hawaiian shirt, pajama pants, and purple Crocs during the tournament. If you think for one second Cameron will not snap a picture of that, or even I need a more video, than a picture. We need video of that to add into the podcast on that episode. I'll bring the GoPro and we can post it on the we can post it on the Facebook. So about a month from now, look for the podcast episode mm-hmm. with Chris wearing this goofy outfit and lightning bolts in his head during a fishing tournament. So those who listen to this on Podbean or iTunes or you know. Yeah, I think Facebook. You're gonna want to get on the YouTube page. So and when, check yeah, this when out. you hear this episode on mm-hmm. the audio format, yes. make sure you go back to your Lake Fort Guide YouTube channel and check out the video format. We'll put it right in the beginning of the podcast. That's right. To make it easy for you guys to yeah. find. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, uh, what I'll do is I'll bring the Bro. Uh, I'll bring the GoPro and we'll we'll just film the whole day. Yeah. Both days. I mean, whatever. And you better act like Ricky Bobby if you do something good at that time. Oh, you better tell. What? <laughs> I'll love doing my hands. <laughs> I mean, Car ran real good. Yeah. God, if I catch a frog fish in that outfit. Oh. You know who I'm going to act like? I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to act like Billy Ray Cyrus. April 18th at Lake of the Pines, if you don't catch a frog fish in that outfit, you all have to get punished again. Because oh. if you can't catch a frog fish April 18th on Lake of the Pines, you probably ought to sell your stuff. You shouldn't be allowed to own a frog rod. I'm bringing four rods. They're all gonna have a frog. <laughs> fro- bring one flipping rod and three frog rods. Yeah, right. Lake of the Ponds in April, especially after all the rain we're having this time right now. Yeah, bring bring your frog rod and your flipping rod and leave everything else at home. I've never fished it in my life. Maybe a swim jig. Yeah. You know what's? <laughs> they eat a frog when that lake that time of year. Yeah, now. I could have heard. Yeah, could have heard. Do. I'm excited about they it. Do. I mean, you know how it is, man. Sometimes you, sometimes you get humbled at your home pond, and that's what happened. So. Adapt and overcome. Ashley loves me. That's right. It happened. Ask a lot of guys over the years. No, I'm telling like, you, man. It's a just... lot of guys over the years when they go to their home late get humble. We're fixing to get off on a whole nother <laughs> podcast. <brand. laughs> Let's save that one for the next episode, and uh, maybe we'll talk about the struggles of fishing a tournament on your home lake. That'll be a good topic on the next episode. Don't fish history. Don't fish history. There you go. Hey, guys, thank y'all so much for tuning in. I hope you guys are excited about the Lake Fork Tournament like we are with the MLF guys. Hope y'all tune into that this week. Definitely everybody watch that. It should be awesome, awesome bass fishing coverage. If you love this sport, you just had a Bassmaster Classic. The very next week, you're going to have this tournament. Like, It's a really good time to be a bass fishing fan right now. Yeah, if you don't watch this one, you are not a fan of the sport. I'm just saying. Or at least keep up with it. You're right the first time. You're not a fan of the sport. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is going to be an awesome tournament. I'm trying to be less harsh. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But, hey, we sincerely appreciate you guys listening to this. Go check out our fine sponsor, Skeeter Boats, Nautical Mile Marine, Smash Tech Custom Baits, SixCentsFishing.com. If you go get any Six Cents Fishing Baits over at SixCentsFishing.com, punch in that code, your Lake Fort Guide, get a 10% discount on all orders. If you're still listening to this podcast to hear that plug, you're you my hero. <laughs> are amazing. You are certain. Comment below if you still heard. If you heard this part, comment below. Let us know you heard the sponsor plugs so we know who the real ones are. That's right. Because you are definitely 100% a real one if you listen to all of this nonsense that we just rambled through. Chris, do that thing you do. Westside! <laughs> Chase it up on me, dog. Amen.